Today, we're talking about cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is one of many um, security vulnerabilities that result from being able to inject code into something. So code injection is a broad category of security vulnerability that a lot of, um, so for example, SQL injection and cross-site scripting are both examples of code injection. Cross-site scripting is where you inject the code um, and it typically ends up being just uh, injected into a client, so for example a web browser, whereas SQL injection is specifically about injecting SQL instructions to into like database, so, that, so there are extra instructions that get sent to the database. So cross-site scripting is all about basically getting some client-side script that you write or that a malicious person or attacker writes and manages to get it served up to the victims. So typically what that means is other users that are accessing the website and that malicious code ends up being embedded inside that website. Uh, and obviously the script then misbehaves and it does bad things. And it can have quite severe security consequences. I think maybe because it's so common uh, I think a lot of people don't actually realise the kinds of consequences that cross-site scripting can actually cause. So how many cross-site scripting vulnerabilities do you think, do you guys think were actually disclosed publicly in terms of a registered CVE um, in the, since the beginning of January? So keep in mind that um, it won't include any live websites that don't base typically it won't include websites that don't have some kind of bug bounty program um, and most CVEs get registered against like open source projects but you know a bunch of stuff can end up being so a vulnerability has been discovered they contact uh, and try and register for a CVE how many do you think we're looking at just since January a thousand, a thousand? Sorry? 10,000. 10, Sorry? 10. 10? Somewhere, it's somewhere between 10 and 10,000. Three. Three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Three is not between, but anyway. Um, should we have a look? So we can do a search um, on the NVD. So we have. 346 vulnerabilities that are cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that are publicly registered and um, and disclosed uh, on the CVE database. Uh, and so it won't include any that are currently uh, non-disclosed yet. So sometimes the, if the vulnerability has been discovered but it hasn't finished the um, you know resolution of it going public kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, so 346. And it's not as many as 10,000, but it is a lot. So the, especially considering the constraints that I mentioned earlier, um, like a lot of websites, a lot of people won't bother registering a CVE for finding a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a website. Um, so, so yeah, it's a lot, not as many as 10,000 though. So it is actually the most prevalent security vulnerability that exists. So it used to be that buffer overflows were the most common. Uh, and for a long time, for a long, long time they were, because basically when servers get written in C, it's very easy to make a programming mistake that ends up with a buffer overflow. But more and more software is being created as websites. Uh, and as you'll see in a few minutes, it's really easy to end up with cross-site scripting vulnerability in a website. So it is the most prevalent of any kind of security vulnerability. Obviously, it's specifically related to web security. And um, they've been reported and exploited since the 90s. So typically what basically ends up happening as a result is you have this website and you end up with malicious content mixed in with the other content of the website and because the script 
is running the, the malicious author's code, it can do stuff uh, and but the sorts of things it can do is basically anything within the context of that website. So it can, the, the script can access any of the content on the page, it could alter the content on the page, it could access the cookies, session information, uh, anything that the page contains or that that website does on behalf of that user. So the malicious script, for example, might start initiating actions as though it was the user had clicked on something or the user's doing something. Uh, and so, yeah, the script can alter or um, steal any of that information. And obviously one of the big ones is it can result in session hijacking. So if you recall from last week when we are talking about um, cookies and session management, if you can get someone's cookies, typically you can basically just take over their account. So a cross-site scripting vulnerability gives you JavaScript running on their computer in their browser. It can quite easily get the cookies from your, that session and send them to the attacker. Um, also, if the user has sensitive information, uh, you can access that sensitive information that um, you know might be displayed on that page for that user that you know might be secret information. Um, including personal conversations um, like or images or whatever happens to be stored on, on that site. Um, I mentioned before, performing actions on behalf of the victims. Uh, you can do what's known as content spoofing. So basically just changing the content of the site, you could basically be deceived because you've logged into this website and everything else is acting as normal, but my bank balance is actually, it says it's one value, but it's a different value. Um, and because it can perform actions on behalf of the victims, maybe it sent some money off to someone else, for example. Uh, it can redirect, the, redirect users to other websites. Can do, one of the ways that might be making money is just by swapping out advertising or adding advertising to the pages that you're viewing. And potentially, it can either be directed at one specific user or depending on the kind of um, cross-site scripting vulnerability that it is, it might affect all of the users on that website. Um, we'll talk about the kinds of vulnerabilities um, in a minute. But So it's either going to affect one person that's followed a link or everyone that uh, visits the website. Um, I'm going to play a video now, and it's quite short. Um, and this is a guy called Tom Scott. I don't know if you've watched any of his Twitter on YouTube. have just had a self-retweeting tweet, which should never have happened. Worry, isn't it? So I think that's a, um, like, it's nice to see examples where this stuff actually applies. So that, that was a cross-site scripting vulnerability in, in TweetDeck. And I'll talk about some more uh, examples in a minute. So. The, one of the things that exists to try and limit what JavaScript can do is the same origin policy. And so the same origin policy basically defines the origin of some, um, some, a script. Uh, in this case, it's based on the, the URL, the URI, uh, which is the, basically the host name and the port number. And when there are scripts from that same origin, they get access to the data, um, like access to the DOM, cookies, and, and whatever, whatever else. So without that policy, websites could just be interacting with each other. You'd have one page open that will just like start accessing your bank details, for example, because you've got that open in another tab. But th that's not allowed because of the same origin policy, so that websites just get their own things. Um, obviously, if you imagine what the web, what the internet would be like if there wasn't that protection, well, we wouldn't be able to do things like internet banking, right? There are ways that scripts can talk to each other or pages on your computer can interact with each other. So there are, is like cross-document messaging. So you can have like two tabs open and those pages that are local on your computer can communicate using post message which is like a JavaScript feature where they can basically talk to each other. You've got web sockets, which is like a network connection, so they, they can talk to each other or back to a server. You've also got cross-origin resource sharing, which is where when the server serves up a website, a web page, it could say that basically 
other people can access this as well. So if it serves up a piece of JavaScript, you might say, well, actually, let this run anywhere. Or um, you know, it serves up some kind of resource and says, other people can access this. Other sites can access it on your computer. And then the web browser um, then enforces that. Uh, there's also document.domain property where JavaScript can set its own domain, like origin. And if two pages set it to the same thing, then they can communicate with each other. So there's a few things that um, can happen, but they're all very tightly controlled around what um, websites are allowed to share with each other that are on, like, running on your computer. So the cross-site scripting is basically where we've got the malicious script. It gets sent typically to the server um, by the client, uh, and it affects the website that's generated. So the, the client is basically sending something to the server, uh, and then that server is then basically echoing it back to the client. So this is a non-persistent cross-site scripting where basically it's never actually stored on the server, but I send you a link, for example, and that link has something that I want you to send to the server because then the server is going to send it back to you, basically. is uh, And that's called a, client, a type 2 cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability or uh, reflected cross-site scripting or non-persistent. There's like lots of different names for it. But basically, it's cross-site scripting where nothing's stored on the server. Uh, and usually the way that you would do that is basically I'll send you a link in an email or an instant message or by putting it on a website. And then when you click on that thing, it's going to send you to the website and your browser is going to send certain information to that system. Uh, and you basically, as an attacker, you try and make it look innocent. Uh, common, one of the common ways of trying to make the, um, the links look innocent is you can do different encoding methods that the browser will understand but that humans find hard to read. So rather than um, you know, having some really obvious like script tag in the actual um, link, you can encode that in ways that are hard for humans to read, but the computers obviously just interpret as being like the, the, the text. Um, so as a result, the victim clicks the link. The link basically sends the information to the server. The server then generates a website which contains uh, the JavaScript on it that ends up back on the victim's computer in the website that's been generated so that the, there's malicious stuff going on, uh, but nothing stored in the server. So <clears throat> on the other hand, persistent or stored cross-site scripting, or type 1, is where the server actually stores that information. And then later, when other users or, or any user accesses that information from the um, database, for example, they get fed the script. So this is much worse. So rather than having to send a link to someone, I managed to get the script, malicious script into the database of that website. So for example, if it's asking me to type a comment or a message to someone, and it, it lets me type in script into that message that gets stored in the database, and then when they log into the website, or anyone logs into like a website to see the messages that are there, and that same thing gets fed to all the web browsers of all the people who visit that website, and they all end up having that JavaScript running in their web browsers. And I don't need to do anything anymore as the attacker because it's stored in the database of that website, and it's going to be fed to the users, as opposed to with the reflected cross-site scripting where they actually have to click a link in order that you know you have to get the, the victim to click a link. So stored cross-site scripting is worse, basically. Uh, there's a third kind, which is, I guess, very recent. And in and, and the first week of this semester, I was talking about how the internet's moving more and more towards really full clients with lots of logic, where more and more of the website is actually moving into the web browser as opposed to being generated by the server. And as we move in that direction, it's now but getting to the point where you have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities being directed at the, the software running in the browser as opposed to being directed at the server. So rather than 
sending the malicious um, information input to the server to generate the HTML, the input's being sent to the local browser, which generates that malicious content. And the, for example, jQuery plugins have been found to be vulnerable in the past to um, DOM-based or server-side, um, uh, sorry, client-side, client um, sorry, my confusing title confused me there. <laughs> so I'm saying normally everything else I've talked about is server-side and this is a client-side version of that, of cross-site scripting. Um, but you will come across that a lot less, although as time goes on, I'm sure it will become more and more um, common. So in case, you've, uh, in case you're not that familiar with web technologies, things like AngularJS or um, you know, Vue or React, these, these um, frameworks basically mean that the JavaScript is becoming bigger and bigger and that basically runs in the web browser and does most of the work and the server's basically just feeding it information as opposed to generating all the HTML that gets sent there. Uh, so another example of cross-site scripting is a Facebook vulnerability uh, and someone won a um, $3,500 bug bounty for finding this one. Uh, there's a little bit more in this uh, blog post if you want to read it. It's quite a simple one. Basically, they um, at the end result, they went to a website like Pinterest, created a pin with this name. So basically, closing a tag, opening an image tag with an invalid source, and then on error, alert document .domain. Uh, And so the, if this is successful at cross-site scripting, it's going to create an alert that prints out the um, the domain that the that the script's been run from. Uh, and they shared it on Facebook and click the share button and lo and behold, cross out scripting vulnerability in Facebook. Um, and so there's another example of cross out scripting in another popular website. YouTube had a um, stored cross out scripting vulnerability like the last one uh, in the comments section of YouTube. Uh, and it did get fixed, but for a while there were all kinds of vandalism happening on YouTube, where people were visiting YouTube and, being, and you know getting pop, um, like this kind of website shown. So there, there's been you know cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in loads of really well-known websites. It's really easy to make the programming mistake. So here is the is, is I'm just going to do a quick little demo, um, and this is the simplest website that I could um, think of to demonstrate a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So in this example, we've got a PHP website. What it does is it um, has a variable. So that this is some PHP code and this is some HTML. So in a PHP code, it's got a variable called name and it basically gets the name from the request. So the arguments in the URL that have been typed uh, and it gets the name and it starts a session. Uh, so in PHP, uh, you can, you know, we talked about session management. PHP can can basically do that for you as a pro when you're a programmer writing in PHP, you can say, okay, start a session for me. It's going to do all the stuff like randomly generates a session token and uh, as a cookie, and it's going to automatically send it and manage the session and everything. So do that so that we've got something interesting to look at, and then. We've got some HTML that just starts HTML, and all it's doing is sent printing out hello and then your name. So it should be pretty obvious having just listened to uh, you know, a bunch of information about cross-site scripting as what can go wrong here, but does someone want to volunteer to describe what the security problem is here in this example? That's, yeah, so there's no filtering or sanitization of the name variable, and so then what's the consequence of that? Put anything in. All right, so well, let's look at that. So, okay. Okay, so we've got our code here, and we can just do a quick little self-hosting thing with PHP. Uh, and then in our web browser, we can visit um, our website and so if we do what we're expecting we can put the name of world and it generates hello world which is all very nice um, 
and just test that it's all working properly. So we can set the name in the URL and basically the code's just, you know, obviously feeding that through and serving it up in, in the page. And so just to like make it crystal clear what's going on here, if we actually view the source of the web page, so what the web browser is receiving, it's this. So it is receiving that as the source um, that it's rendering to the screen. So if in the name, instead of putting AAA, we put um, I don't know, script tag. Then what happens is we've just insert, inserted some JavaScript and you know we can you know pop up an alert. Uh, we can so obviously we can pop an alert. Uh, we could also access the cookies. So document dot and now we've got so this is our session ID um, for this um, you know session. PHP has created a new session for this. So if this is a proper website that's actually doing something interesting, that is the information that you'd need to steal access to this account. Um, we can do, I mean, we can do all sorts of things. So yeah, we can pop up an alert, but also we might um, instead want to change the content of the website. So we could do document dot uh, body dot uh, in a HTML, yeah, there we go, uh, equals uh, and then we've just completely replaced the HTML code of the whole website with something else uh, because on the fly, so that's what I was talking about before about um, content spoofing, so if you look at the page source it's loading that up but that script is basically going to replace the actual HTML of the body of the website with this. And we could put an entirely different website that would then get loaded uh, when that site is loaded. Um, and yeah, so you can see there's, um, it's very easy to introduce. I think if you hadn't heard of cross-site scripting before and you saw this website, it wouldn't be immediately obvious that there was a security problem there. Like if you literally have not done PHP programming before, or you know, you hadn't been told specifically about this. You'd look at that and go, "That's quite reasonable, and looks like the sort of thing that you you might create yourself." Which is why it's so easy to end up with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in your code because it is just so easy to do. So the sorts of things you can try when you're testing for cross-site scripting is you can try you know, just entering the script uh, to create an alert, see if it pops an alert. Uh, you, can, you can do more obscure things as well. So obviously popping up an alert um, might be, or, in, or for example, just searching for script tags is not the only way you can insert JavaScript onto a website. So in this example, we're basically adding a, a bold tag with some text in it that says click me and it's creating a mouse over event that creates the alert. Um, and so if you were just trying to trying to pull out any angular brackets or the word script, uh, sorry angular brackets, would, it still ha contains an angular bracket, but if you're just searching for a script for example, this would circumvent that protection. Um, so really if you're looking for cross site scripting, if you've got access to the source code, you basically want to read through the source code and look at, okay, where is it receiving any input from a user and where that and do, does it actually end up back in the HTML that's generated that's sent back to them? And if that if the answer is ever yes, then it's like, well, okay, exactly what happens to that information to make sure it's safe before it gets um, displayed to the user. So you know, James correctly mentioned before that basically it wasn't sanitized or validated. So the um, basically whenever you've got any data coming from an untrusted source, you need to do both, like either validate or sanitize it before you use it. 
So the difference is validation is where you check that it is fine, it's safe. Sanitization is where you make sure it's safe. So validation is you look at it and go, there's nothing dangerous there. If it's literally just like alphanumeric characters, then you can go, oh, that's actually quite safe. There's not much that can go wrong. Or sanitization is where you take something that has something that's invalid and you make it valid, either by removing it entirely, just saying, okay, I'm just gonna remove any angular brackets. You're just not allowed that. That's actually quite a safe way to do it. Or you try and make it safe by encoding it in a way where it's not going to do the malicious thing. So, um, okay. So, so yeah. So we're trying to fix it to make it safe. And what you can do is basically remove everything that you don't actively expect, rather than removing what you what you know you don't want. So why do you think that is like a good approach to take? Why do we... Is it better to remove everything we don't expect or to remove the things that we know are bad? More things are bad than we know. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the difficult things about like whitelists versus blacklists. Blacklists are um, maybe easier, like a, like a malware scanner, for example, will just be trust everything except I've got some stuff that I don't want you to do. Similar here, where, but then all you need to do is create some new malware and it, you know, and it will circumvent it. So similar here, if you can just restrict everything except for stuff you know is safe, that is the safest thing to do. But often you want to be quiet lenient, especially with websites when you've got people commenting to each other. If someone puts an angular bracket in, do you want people to be able to have a message that actually literally shows an angular bracket? Maybe the answer is yes, and so you need to find a safe way of actually doing it. Um, so the other thing to think about is where this validation happens or the sanitization happens. Do we do it on the client or the server? Um, what do you guys think? So the web browser, for example, you've got a, a um, something where you've got the uh, end users on a website and you've got them typing and commenting that they're going to leave on the website. Uh, should the web browser be checking for Angular brackets or the server? Both. Sorry? Both. Both? Why? Um, more secure. <laughs> okay. Both because it's more secure. Is it? Genuine question. Is it more secure to be checking the client and the server? The server only in terms of providing actual security. Assuming we're talking about a server that's generating the HTML, so not the case where the JavaScript's actually generating the whole website, like what happens a lot nowadays. But traditionally, where the server's generating the HTML, like most websites are still less this way, then actually, it doesn't matter. You guys have seen, but you can have a web browser, it can send anything, but you can just intercept that with a proxy. And basically, it doesn't matter. The, the browser might say, oh, you're not allowed to put an Angular bracket in. OK, well, I'll just fire up a proxy and I'll change it to an Angular bracket. Or I'll just fire up a manual HTML request and fire that off against the server. So really, the checking on the client only helps in terms of usability because it's quicker if the website knows, if the web browser says, oh, red, you know, no, you can't put an angular bracket in. It's easier for the user rather than waiting till they click submit and then it comes back and says, no, that message wasn't valid. So from a usability perspective, it's good to have the client checking stuff. But from a security perspective, if the web server is generating the HTML, that's where the validation and um, sanitization has to happen. Otherwise, you've got no security. If you've only got client side checking, then you've got security through obscurity. Like actually, if it's not providing any security, it gives you the illusion of it because it won't let you put an Angular bracket in. But actually, all you need to do is forcibly send an Angular bracket to the server, ignoring what the web browser is telling you, and then you can break the website that way. So 
it has to happen on the server and it should happen on the client, um, especially if there's logic in the client and that's where the, obviously if it's a DOM based cross site scripting, which still is quite rare, but if that's the case, then it needs to happen on the client side as well. So how do we prevent it? Well, we should use safe encoding methods to make sure that the, um, the input data is not interpreted as code. So for example, when you've got an ampersand, you can convert it to this, which is basically the way that we can represent an ampersand. Uh, if we've got a uh, less than or greater than symbol, um, then we use uh, less than or greater than, so ampersand LT um, semicolon. And for quotes, we use quote uh, and so on. So we've got these codes that we can use to, rather than actually sending the Angular bracket. So if, if the user is typing a message, they put an Angular bracket in, well, instead of sending the Angular bracket, we send this. So the web browser knows that it displays the Angular bracket rather than interpreting it as the actual like part of the source code to say that a script's about to start, for example. And we want to escape all input using appropriate safe libraries. Um, <coughs> but it can still go wrong. So if you poorly sanitize something, there are, you can use clever attacks to, um, to basically circumvent poor sanitization or poor validation. So for example, without recursive sanitization, one pass might actually end up with a, a malicious string. So it might be that if you replace every time they've literally just got the word um, script, with uh, like just remove it well what if they've got skr and then script and then ripped and then you take the middle script out and you well oh, you've got another one still so you know you need to do some clever clever parsing to make sure that you really are making things secure and for that reason similar to what i was saying about session management last week unless you really know what you're doing and you're spending a lot of time on it don't try and reinvent the sanitization and validation stuff use existing libraries um, that have been well tested uh, and use those in your code to, to remove, uh, to make sure that things are safe. There are multiple methods for injecting JavaScript and it's not just via script tags, although you know, the first thing you think of with cross-site scripting is you literally put a script tag in. If that's the thing that's being removed, well, there are other ways to get JavaScript into a website. Uh, and there's a long list <coughs> of um, things that you can do to try and make things safe and there are different kinds of encoding that you can use in different instances to basically make things safe uh, and I'm not going to try and cover all of that now but just so you're aware when you are creating a website or if you're, if you're auditing a website for security you need to make sure that the appropriate encoding methods are used to make things safe and if you go to the OWASP website um, there's a prevention cheat sheet for cross-site scripting um, and you can look through that. Uh, it's quite, quite a good reference. So in conclusion, cross-site scripting is really easy programming mistake to make, uh, but it has massive security consequences um, for clients and um, it is the most common security vulnerability that exists in the world right now. So it's worth knowing about. All right. Yeah. Any questions about anything? No? OK, cool. Well, I hope, hope you're all uh, enjoying the module. We actually, instead of finishing at, the, at like one minute two, we've actually finished with at the time we're supposed to finish. So uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thanks.